Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to this episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. Just like in the previous episode with Dr. Brian Roth, I recorded this episode with Dr. Arun Shukla from my car, parked in front of the Wi-Fi spot near my home last July. Arun is currently an associate professor and Joy Guild chair professor at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kampur, India. As you all may know, Dr. Shukla worked in Dr. Bob Lefkowitz's lab at Duke University. After a while, he moved back to India. Today, he and his team currently work on better understanding how two beta arrestin isoforms can regulate GPCR function, knowing that there are 800 GPCRs out there. Before we jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know that our October newsletter is now available. Please visit drgpcr.com newsletter to subscribe and share our newsletter with your colleagues. The October newsletter was made possible by Twist Biopharma. If you'd like to support and sponsor us, please visit drgpcr.com sponsors or email us at hello at drgpcr.com. Join us and learn more about Dr. Shukla's research and how working in the lab instead of going to classes made him realize that research is what he wanted to do for the rest of his life. Hello, listeners. I'm Dr. Yamina Bershish, founder of Dr. GPCR. Uh, welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Arun Shukla. He is an associate professor at the Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, and I'm very happy to have you here today. Hi, Arun. Hi, Yamin. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Especially with the time difference, so I had to Google and figure out what would be the best time for, for us to chat. So, um, as I said, um, you're at the Indian Institute of Technology. Can you tell us a little bit more about your, your career and trajectory that led you to where you are today? Right. So, I did my master's in biotechnology from uh, one of the central universities in New Delhi. It's uh, called... Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU. And uh, while I was doing my master's, uh, I was doing a project working on uh, four-stranded DNA structures, DNA quadruplex structures. And I was presenting it in a meeting in Bangalore where I met with Professor Hartwood Mitchell, who was visiting um, an institution in Bangalore at that time. And that is how I sort of... Uh, uh, started talking to him and uh, requested for a PhD position in his lab. And he offered me one. And after finishing my master's, I moved to his lab at the Max Planck Institute of Biophysics in Frankfurt, in Germany. So um, during my PhD, I was working on uh, expression purification of several different GPCRs with the goal to structurally characterize them in terms of crystallography or also use other structural techniques such as NMR to get structural information. And when I finished my PhD, I was essentially sort of uh, looking for a postdoctoral position. I was studying the literature in the field. Uh, one name that kept, kept popping up uh, was Bob Lefkowitz's name, uh, who is at Duke University. So uh, I wrote an email to him and I just said, come on over <laughs> with the email. So no formal interview, nothing of that sort. Uh, I just shared my CV, invited me. So I went to his lab uh, where I wanted to learn more about uh, GPCR signaling, uh, the concept of uh, bias paganism, mm -hmm. uh, GPCR beta arrest interaction, and so on. And there, um, I worked in a very close collaboration with Brian Kobilka's lab, where once again, we tried to characterize uh, GPCR complexes, specifically GPCR beta arrestin complexes, using X-ray crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy, and so on, with the ultimate goal of understanding how this interaction happens, how this regulates GPCR signaling, and with implications towards bias paganism. Um, although I went to Germany and then to US for my PhD and postdoc, I always had it in the back of my mind that I wanted to see 
how research happens in these places, that is, the best places to do research uh, in the world. And then I always wanted to come back to see uh, if we can sort of work at the same level back in my home country, and if I can contribute towards developing a better infrastructure, better scientific uh, sort of research ecosystem in India, and whatever I have learned during my PhD and postdoc, to sort of share uh, my journey, my experience with the next generation of students in the country. So I, towards the end of my postdoctoral research, I interviewed at multiple institutions in India. I had multiple offers. Uh, the place that I liked the most was this Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur because of the academic freedom and the infrastructure that is in place and being one of the IITs in the country, it attracts best uh, PhD students and master's students. So then back in 2014, uh, I joined here in this Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering and the journey continues since then. That's great. And since then, you've been making fantastic contributions to the field. So it's, it's Thank you. great. Um, one, one question. In the beginning, you had mentioned that uh, you, at, during your master's degree, you were working on DNA. And then you made the switch to GPCRs. What piqued your interest to, to go ahead and study GPCRs? So um, in master's, we are for studying uh, many different courses in biochemistry, cell biology, um, and so on. And uh, cell signaling, when we studied it in the first semester of our master's course, that fascinated me a lot. The way how signal travels across the membrane uh, was something that uh, we studied in biochemistry. And I was very sort of curious to learn more about it. Um, in the master's in the second year, we had to do a research project. At that point, I was not, to be honest, not sure if research is what I wanted to take up as a career. But once I started working in a research lab for my master's thesis, I loved it so much that I will miss my theory classes to work in the lab. <laughs> and as a result, um, I think the project that I was working on turned out uh, very well. And that is where I realized uh, research is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And when I met uh, Professor Hartford Mitchell, he sort of talked about the things which were going on in his lab and GPCR structural characterization. One of those was one of the projects uh, which were active in his lab. And that is where I sort of uh, got engaged and started working with them. Fantastic. So you're interested in the in the molecular determinants that would help understanding the activation of GPCRs very right. much at the plasma membrane where where things happen. Um, right. Basically, I think we're, there was a lot of us who are very much in love with with whatever happens at the plasma membrane, whether with the receptor, the ligand binding and the immediate effectors. Right. That's correct. That's fantastic. Um, do you have a, a favorite family of GPCRs or a favorite signaling protein that has anything to do with, with GPCRs? So um, what we're interested in right now um, and what we've been doing for the past several years is to understand uh, the interaction of GPCRs with beta westerns. Now, why GPCR beta westerns? Um, there are more than 800 GPCRs, as you know, yep. um, but there are only two isoforms of beta westerns. Um, they're structurally very similar, but uh, they can have uh, quite a significant degree of functional divergence. So the key question that sort of continues to fascinate us is how two isoforms of beta resistance are able to interact with such a large repertoire of GPCRs and regulate their function. That is their signaling, their uh, endocytosis, uh, their ubiquitination, for example, so this is the aspect which we are interested in, in particular. In terms of receptor systems, um, there are multiple receptors that we are looking at. And the choice of receptors are primarily sort of guided by the diversity that exists in GPCR beta resin interaction. So what I mean by that is some receptors, if you look at them, they have short intracellular loops and relatively long tail or the carboxyl terminus. 
and most of the serine threonine, that is phosphorylation sites, which are a critical determinant of beta rustin binding, are in their carboxyl Complement receptor C5AR1, vesopressin receptor V2R, being some of the key examples. Then there are some receptors which have very short carboxyl terminus, but very large uh, ICL3, for example. Musculinic receptor M2 is an example. Uh, some of the do uh, dopamine receptor subtypes have such architecture. So there the question is, um, can beta rustins primarily engage through the ICLs, that's ICL3 in particular. Then, um, I know this is Dr. GPCR podcast, but there are some other receptors that we're interested in. And these receptors are referred to as non-canonical seven transmembrane receptors. So they're classified in the GPCR family. They have seven transmembrane architecture, but they do not couple to G proteins. So they were sort of classified as non-signaling or non-functional seven transmembrane receptors. But uh, since the whole concept of beta rustin mediated signaling appeared uh, in the field, these receptors, the so-called non-canonical GPCRs or non-functional uh, GPCRs, they turned out to be interacting very robustly with beta rustins. And we have other people in the, in the field as well as our lab uh, has now established that these receptors can indeed signal through, GP, uh, through beta rustins. So the so-called non-canonical or non-signaling uh, GPCRs are in fact, in a way, sort of uh, beta rustin coupled receptors. Like CXCR7. Like CXCR7, absolutely. One of my favorites. Yes, yes. So these receptors display a very unique functional divergence because if you look at their architecture, same seven transmembrane uh, architecture, N terminus outside, C terminus inside, uh, but they do not have any functional coupling to G proteins. Now, what it means is that for these receptors, uh, beta resistance must be adopting a very distinct uh, conformation when it binds to the receptor because unlike prototypical GPCRs, beta resistance don't have to mediate desensitization because there's no G protein coupling in the first place. So these are also some of the receptors. So CXCR7 is one. There is another receptor called uh, DQIP6 receptor. There is another one called complement C5L2 receptor. So these are also the receptors that we are looking at. And what is interesting about the system is that each of these receptors have a corresponding prototypical GPCR pair, meaning if you take the example of CXCR7, um, the corresponding prototypical GPCR will be CXCR4. Yep. In other words, they are both activated by a common endogenous ligand. In this case, uh, CXCR12. In case of complement receptors C5AR1 and C5AR2, the common endogenous ligand is C5A. Mm -hmm. But despite binding to the same agus, they have very distinct transducer coupling. One couples to both G protein and beta resistance, the other one couples exclusively to beta resistance. So these are the set of receptors that we're looking at with the long, long term goal of understanding the diversity, both structural and functional, in GPCR beta resistance system. Wow, that's fantastic. And it, I don't think I I don't think about the fact that there's just two beta restins often enough. Um, right. You know, people do G protein assays and then they measure beta restin one and beta restin two. At least in my hands, in my experience, both the restins on a couple of receptors I worked with, they did pretty much similar to the right. same thing, but they must be interacting in some different way to have a differential uh, signaling outcome at the end at the end of it um, right. when they get activated. Um, so when when you acquire this information about the specificity and the signaling downstream events of coupling of a receptor with beta restin, uh, what are the methodologies, what are the techniques that you use to try and understand these interactions? Well, so um, we are using a battery of approaches. Um, so right now, one of the key sort of uh, focuses on getting structural information on these complexes using uh, cryo-electron microscopy. Um, the other approaches that we are using to get more dynamic information is, for example, fluorescence spectroscopy or uh, NMR, 
or hydrogen deuterium exchange based uh, conformational uh, difference measurements and things like that. We're also collaborating with people to uh, look at uh, dynamics by molecular dynamics simulation studies and so on. So we are trying to use a whole set of complementary approaches because whether we use X-ray crystallography or cryo EM, typically we get one structural snapshot and we would like to complement that structural information with dynamic information and solution. So we're using a whole set of uh, different biophysical and biochemical approaches. In addition, what we are also doing is we are um, designing and identifying synthetic antibody fragments, such as FABs or single chain antibodies or nanobodies, which not only help us in capturing these complexes for structural studies, but we can also express them inside the cell and see if we can rewire GPCR signaling and regulation. For example, we had identified an antibody fragment which binds to beta arsenine 2 and by binding to beta arsenine 2 it disrupts the interaction of beta arsenine 2 with clathrin, which is a critical determinant for mediating receptor endocytosis and thereby it can inhibit agonist induced GPCR internalization. Now, this interaction of beta arsenine and clathrin is pretty conserved across the GPCR family in terms of its ability to mediate receptor endocytosis. So this one antibody fragment that we had identified to bind to beta arsenine 2 turned out to be quite a generic inhibitor of uh, receptor endocytosis. Uh, more recently, we have developed some antibody fragments that we can express as an intrabody in live cells. Mm -hmm. HEK cells, for example. And because these are synthetic antibody fragments, which we have selected from phage display libraries, we have their complete DNA sequence, so we can uh, you know, modify them by, for example, adding a fluorescent tag, in this case, YFP. And some of these antibody fragments uh, turned out to be a very nice biosensor of receptor beta western interaction. So under basal condition, they're present in the cytoplasm, when the receptor is activated and beta arsenine go to the surface, intrabodies follow them. And then again, after sustained stimulation, when beta arsenines go to the endosomal vesicles, the intrabodies follow them there as well. So they turn out to be a biosensor. So we can have one um, sort of additional approach to monitor GPC or beta arsenine trafficking in the cells. So these are some of the approaches that we are using in the lab. Well, very nice and very complementary tools to, to look at multiple aspects of of receptor activation. Right. That is fantastic. Um, what are, are the other, what, uh, what challenges do you see that would, would need to be addressed to facilitate understanding the function of, of GPCRs? So you have a set of very nice tools. Do you think you need more co compound tools or do you need a way, for example, when you, um, you look at receptor function and you want to crystallize these receptors, finding a way to stabilize them without having to overly mutate them. Right, so I think there are a number of uh, interesting sort of uh, hurdles or challenges, so to say. Um, these complexes are very transient. And eventually, if you think about it, what would be really cool is if we can visualize, as one example, beta rustin complexes bound to, you know, five, six very different receptors, so that we can really figure out uh, how receptors having very distinct ICL uh, sequences or carboxyl terminal sequences really fine tune the function of beta resistance. Now, capturing these complexes is not very easy in vitro. Obviously, in cellular context, these complexes are transient. For crystallography or for cryo EM, we need to stabilize them. So, we are using um, sort of, uh, in a way, synthetic tools such as antibody fragments to capture them. Now that is not possible to apply to every receptor system that we're interested in. The tools that we develop for one receptor, sometimes it works for one receptor, but not for the other. We still have to make some modifications. For example, in this case, uh, in order to get stable interaction with beta arrestin, we have to modify the tail of the receptor that is carboxyl terminus to have uh, more serine and threonine, uh, which can get phosphorylated and therefore beta arrestin binding will be tight. Uh, in some cases, of course, receptors have to be stabilized 
to uh, be captured structurally. So these are some of the challenges uh, that we are sort of struggling with. We are trying to uh, you know, develop new tools around that. Um, something that you mentioned, uh, obviously tool compounds uh, such as high affinity agonists or even uh, bias ligands uh, would be very, very useful. Now, there are some systems where very nice biased ligands are available, but on the other systems where we can capture the complexes, such well-characterized biased ligands do not exist as of yet. Mm -hmm. So it's always uh, one challenge or the other, but uh, together with other groups, other collaborating groups, we are trying to sort of figure out ways how we can address these things going forward. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, so you had mentioned that you work on multiple different receptor receptors that you're interested in and look at the complex of their interaction with beta restins. Uh, if we look at the big picture, um, can you tell us more about how the work that you're doing contributes to better understand GPCR function in specific diseases that these receptors are involved in? Right. So. Obviously, there are implications at the individual receptor levels. Uh, for example, the complement receptors that we are looking at, they are involved in sepsis, inflammation, and other inflammatory uh, disorders. So if we understand how these receptors are regulated by their interaction with um, beta resistance, that will hopefully contribute to understanding the physiological and pathophysiological aspects of those selected receptors. But in a broader sense, um, the information which we gather on selective receptor systems might have some generic impact or some generic information for the entire GPCR family, because many of the things such as phosphorylation dependent interaction of receptor with beta restins or beta restin mediated receptor endocytosis, these things are highly conserved across the family. Um, if I extrapolate it to these non-canonical receptors that we're looking at, as I mentioned, these receptors do not couple to G proteins, but they couple to beta restins, which means they are essentially biased receptors that nature has designed in a way. In other words, these are physiological examples of beta restin biased receptors. So if we understand how these receptors interact with beta restins, and how their interaction with beta restants is different from other prototypical GPCRs, this can have direct implications for the whole concept of biased agonism that has uh, gathered quite a bit of attention in the context of novel therapeutics. Yeah, definitely, biased agonism has, has been on everybody's radar for quite some time now. Um, speaking of, of biased agonism, uh, there have been indications that let me let me rephrase that. So, for biased agonism for a long time, for example, in the um, in the context of opioid receptors, people were focused on finding bias ligands that would activate G proteins, but not beta restins, in order to get the uh, the analgesic effect without the secondary uh, effects that come with it. Um, recently, it has been shown that it's not as clear cut, and uh, it's a little bit more complex than that. What are your thoughts on biased agonists and using biased agonists to treat as, as, uh, as molecules to treat diseases. So um, the examples that you are citing on opioid receptors, uh, I am uh, aware of those. And um, you're absolutely right that it's not as clear as uh, it was conceived in the beginning. Um, but I think the jury is still out. Uh, there are some experimental differences among different studies that can account for some of this. But clearly, uh, in the recent studies, it seems that it may not be as straightforward, like you know, simple bifurcation of the two uh, different signaling pathways. But that has been observed for some of the other receptors as well. Um, for other, some other cases, um, this seems to be uh, you know, more clear. For example, there was a recent paper on uh, neurotensin receptor biased uh, agonist, um, where there's very clear cut in vivo data to suggest the therapeutic potential of uh, beta resin bias ligand at this receptor. So I think as we develop more and more tools, more and more approaches, that is assays, um, and we gather more and more structural information, I think 
this will help us get a holistic picture of how this whole uh, biased agonism or biased signaling is actually functioning in the cellular context. What are the determinants which we do not understand right now? For example, there are uh, specific cases where there seems to be some sort of uh, contribution of cell types that are used. In some cases, um, the assays which are used to characterize uh, biostagism and biostagus that also seems to play a role. So I think we do not come, uh, understand it very well. And going forward with new tools, with new um, sort of approaches, as we gather more and more information, I think this will help us realize the potential of bias ligands better, and perhaps also guide our efforts to design them better and use them in a better way in the clinical setting. Agreed. And also being able to understand the biological pathways that lead to the disease and right. that are happen during those disease states is also very important to, to be sure that we're, you know, biasing a ligand to the correct uh, biological function, which right. is very important. Absolutely. Um, and yes, cellular context is also, also important. You had mentioned that uh, you use hex cells, for example, to, to study the function uh, of the receptors. There have been discussions about, you know, using hex cells and they're an quote unquote artificial system. What are your thoughts about uh, the information that is gained out of assays ran in hex cells? So uh, like many others in the field, I think uh, these cells are a good starting point to characterize, uh, you know, the lead compounds, for example, or some of the promising compounds. But eventually it is very important to uh, verify and validate these things in primary cell lines and then eventually in in vivo or animal models, of course, that is uh, the real proof. Um, but in many cases, um, you know, going directly to the primary cell line or to the in vivo model uh, either is not feasible or may not be the most straightforward way. So I think in terms of initial characterization, uh, doing as many assays as possible and looking at these assays in a holistic sense and understanding the limitations of the assays that we are using is very important to properly characterize and then sort of uh, taking the most promising compounds forward. But you're absolutely right that, you know, using simple overexpression HEK-based system, it can be good for initial characterization, but that is not the last word on the complete property of any compound that is being characterized. That's there. It's, <clears throat> they're easy. It's a very simple system. It's very useful. And I think one of the advantages is that you can, you can run multiple assays in the same assay system. Uh, and right. uh, nowadays with, with high throughput screens and with, better performing readers, for example, you can run more compounds, but you definitely need to, to remember that it's, it's, it's an quote unquote artificial system and you need right. further, uh, further validation for, for, those, for those compounds where you get ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, so one of my questions was, do you think GPCRs are a good drug target? Um, knowing that they're such a complex family of receptors Yes, over the past 30 years, we've learned a lot. We've cloned a lot of them. There's still uh, receptors that are being discovered. Just last month, there was a new GPCR that has been cloned. Right. Um, but what are your thoughts on using GPCRs as, as drug targets? Well, I think uh, we're having this podcast. It means they must be very important. Um, and I think as we are discovering new um, sort of signaling mechanisms or even deorphanizing some of the uh, remaining receptors, uh, we're discovering new biology. So um, I think there will continue to be hot drug targets uh, for quite some time. And I think that is good for all of us who are engaged in uh, GPCR research. Um, again, as we touched upon uh, the concept of biostagonism, that continues to remain at the forefront. So I think uh, these are good targets to study. And I think the importance for drug target is obviously uh, very, very um, critical. But to understand the biology, how these receptors in fact do so many things. If you think about 
the uh, simple architecture of a cell and transmembrane scaffold, being able to bind uh, a small hormone, a peptide, a protein, a lipid, or even by uh, getting activated by a photon of light. This diversity um, in terms of recognition of signal or message is amazing. So even from that point of view, and then again, how these different messages are conveyed across the membrane, how a small set of effectors can mediate and do so many different things. I think this will take us many, many, many more years to really understand at the molecular level. So I think uh, these uh, receptors will continue to be exciting uh, for a very, very long time. What are your thoughts about, um, about thinking, saying, well, the drugs, the current drugs that target GBCRs were the quote unquote easy ones and the low hanging fruit has already been picked. Uh, do you think it is the case? And do you think now that to get more drugs targeting GPCRs in the clinic and hopefully in patients to help them uh, is will require a much more um, a significant effort to get those? Right. So um, obviously there are um, the ones which are already in the trial uh, or which are already used. Um, in a way, you can say these were low-hanging fruits because they were uh, discovered earlier. But of course, every drug that has been discovered, as you know, uh, better than anybody else, has taken a lot and a lot and a lot of effort to uh, characterize and discover and take you to the clinic. Yeah. So it has never been easy. Um, obviously, as we, for example, deorphanize new receptors or um, discover new ligands uh, in terms of lead compounds, whether in terms of allosteric compounds or bias ligands, um, it will continue to take quite a bit of effort to really characterize them and then take them to the clinics. Uh, considering that, uh, you know, in, in a sense, the receptors which are targeted by current drugs, they, I mean, the industry and uh, people who are interested in those must have tried many, many different things, many, many different ligands, many lead compounds to then, you know, finally come to one ligand, which has become a drug. Um, in a way, if you discover a new receptor or de a new receptor, obviously the entire exercise has to be repeated in a way. Yeah. So it will continue to take uh, quite a bit of uh, effort uh, for the new targets. There's no doubt about it. But what is also exciting is, as you mentioned uh, briefly, things are improving in terms of speed, both in terms of high throughput screening or even uh, something that has come to the forefront right now, uh, structure-based uh, virtual screening. You must be familiar with uh, the work that uh, Brand Schweikert and uh, Brand Roth's lab, yeah. they have been doing where they are screening not millions, but billions of compounds in a way to explore the chemical space. So I think it's a mix. It's never going to be easy, but some of the tools, some of the new approaches that are being discovered, they, they should be able to, you know, speed up the process to some extent. They, they are. They are. And you're right. Being able to do virtual screenings um, definitely is a significant improvement. And it also helped reduce the hands-on time in the lab when right. you can screen you. I cannot imagine being able to screen billions of, of compounds in the lab as fast as, as doing it on a computer right. nowadays. Right. Um, so to better understand GPCR function and to better uh, target them in the clinic, you need structural information, you need to understand their biology. Are there any key other elements that are missing to help us speed up drug discovery? Um, I think the paradigms that we are working uh, with, that is signaling through G-protein, signaling through beta resistance, um, this perhaps may be an uh, oversimplification. There might be other, not only effector molecules, but also the crosstalk is perhaps not completely appreciated. Um, and going forward, some of the approaches such as you know, global phosphoproteomics or interactomic screens that are being done more frequently, they are really eliminating the intricate network of signaling pathways that are involved downstream of these receptors. 
So understanding this uh, very intricate network of uh, signaling pathways and signaling mechanisms um, may help us explain, for example, um, some of the side effects or why some of the drugs you know, do not, some of the ligands do not make it to the clinic uh, as uh, they were expected. So I think understanding this, uh, the signaling network in a holistic system, in a crosstalk, in a network sense, is very important for us to incorporate in the drug discovery uh, framework. Um, obviously, there are efforts along that direction where instead of simply looking at, for example, primary G protein versus uh, beta resistant coupling, now people have designed sensors for everything that you can think of at this point, that is the entire subfamily of G proteins, different beta resistance, uh, PKA, PKC, different GRKs. So that gives us a broad picture of what are the different components which uh, are not only involved in receptor signaling and regulation, but also their crosstalk. And I think if we can incorporate this aspect in um, the drug discovery efforts, this will really help us a great deal. Yeah, and you, you were mentioning all these biosensors that can measure basically anything that happens when a receptor is ex is activated. I think it's a it's a very nice way to to light up all these pathways and right. be able. The way I see it, it's kind of a sci-fi version of it where you can scan a healthy cell and see what are the pathways that get activated and what are the crosstalks. And in another way, look at a, a disease-related cell and you can detect the differences between the different right. signaling pathways that get activated. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there are a lot of more challenges in the field. There is more work to be done. Uh, what would be your advice to young scientists who, who are interested in contributing to the field or are interested in some of these questions? So um, as we briefly talked about, I think these receptors have been fascinating and they continue to be so. And I think there is a lot to be discovered in uh, this receptor signaling, their activation, their regulation, their physiological and pathophysiological aspects. So uh, I think working with these receptors, it's never going to be out of fashion, so to say. And there's always something new to uh, discover. So those people who would like to sort of join the efforts in this area, uh, they should understand that uh, not only from the drug discovery point of view, but from the basic fundamental biology point of view, uh, there's a lot to be discovered, and uh, investing in these receptors, their time and their effort, will definitely be fruitful. Agreed, agreed. I think there is also the 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 need and the wanting to to discover new things and to try and understand right. these these molecules. I I first my first contact with with GPCR is a little bit similar to yours. I was in undergrad, and we were studying. A GPCR function and signaling and Michel Bouvier was teaching the class and I thought oh my goodness they're everywhere they can bind to a variety yeah. of ligands of different sizes and they still are able to somehow do their function even though they can be co-expressed in the same cell right. which I, I find absolutely fascinating um, right. with GPCRs. Um, so you, had, you had mentioned that you were um, you kind of got your first contact with GPCRs during the signaling class uh, during your master's. Um, since then, were there any moments in your career where you made a breakthrough, made a discovery, or learned something that you could characterize as an aha moment in your scientific trajectory? Right. So I think uh, you know, every time um, we get sort of a new piece of data when uh, we design an experiment and uh, we get something new, it can be as simple as just looking at, you know, simple protein-protein uh, interaction or uh, a new ligand, how it interacts with the receptor and activates different certain pathways. Uh, every time we get some new data, it's very exciting. Uh, I don't know if I can classify each of these as aha moments, but uh, seeing that something new with a given receptor, with a given uh, aspect of it, is always very exciting. Um, when, for example, we discovered uh, this intrabody, which was able to inhibit beta-rustin-clathrin interaction, we were very happy. In fact, 
we were designing these intra these antibody fragments to stabilize receptor beta western complexes for structural studies so we did not specifically focus on designing an antibody that will disrupt the interaction rather we hope for something which can stabilize the complex so that we can capture the complex for structural studies but when we got a whole bunch of clones we just started screening them and uh, it turns out that while some of them were stabilizing the complex, there was one which was able to interfere with this interaction. So initially we thought, uh, I personally thought that this is not what we want, but then later we realized uh, in the lab that even if it is not what we want, it can be used for other things, in this case, for blocking the interaction or disrupting the interaction and thereby inhibiting the endocytosis. Um, more recently, um, this biosensor that I was mentioning earlier, again, antibody fragment-based biosensor. Um, this was, this is again an antibody fragment that binds to beta Westin one And this was selected against the active conformation of beta Westin one when beta Westin one is bound to the phosphorylated tail of the vesopressin receptor. Now, the sequence of vesopressin receptor tail, that is the spatial distribution of serine and theonines, which are phosphorylated, is very distinct from other GPCRs. So initially we thought that uh, this is gonna be a biosensor only for V2R, that is vesopressin receptor. But just out of curiosity, we tested it on other receptors as well. And it turns out that it can recognize beta Westin one complex for several other GPCRs, such as neurotensin receptor, C5A uh, complement receptor, and multiple others, but not every GPCR. For example, it does not recognize beta Westin one for radicalin receptor. So immediately this told us that there is some conserved structural feature for some receptor beta Westin pairs, but then there is also structural diversity or conformational diversity for other receptors. So this is something which we were in fact uh, anticipating, but this tool allowed us to visualize this directly in a very simple confocal microscopy based uh, so this was again very exciting and now we're taking lead from this we are um, sort of trying to visualize those differences at high resolution that's very neat uh, i think it's a very neat system because it also allows you to not have to label the beta resin itself right. and you can absolutely in a way classify a specific type of beta resin conformation adopted when it interacts with the C-tail of, for example, the vasopressin receptor and some of those receptors that allow you to, to look at that versus the ones that have potentially a different a distribution of phosphorylated residues. Absolutely, yes. That is, that it's a very, very neat system. Um, congratulations on it. Thank you, thank you. And, it, and it's interesting how it wasn't something that you were necessarily looking for. It just right. happened that you, you you found it and you thought about it and now you have a fantastic tool to study right. the confirmations of beta resin one. That's great. Yes. Yes. That's great. So one of my other questions, which is yeah. a, little, a little bit, it's parallel with the science, was what are your thoughts on increasing diversity in the field? of GPCRs or in science in general? So uh, I think there is absolutely no question about this. This is, you know, we should not be even sort of, uh, I mean, this should be very intuitive. This should be done everything that we can do at our end. Uh, we should uh, try our best to do it. This is, uh, you know, the most important thing. When you think about it, why it has not been done so far, it's, uh, you know, it's really mind boggling. I mean, um, as you know, for example, in, in case of, just to give you one example, uh, in the field of GPCR biology, uh, somebody has taken the initiative to put a list of all the women scientists working on uh, GPCRs. Yeah. And uh, that is one type of diversity that we have to, uh, of course, you know, include. And that is a very good um, uh, starting point. So, you know, when you are, for example, um, trying to put a specific a special issue of a journal or a book uh, a volume, you can really look at the list and invite several people working on, I mean, women scientists working on different aspects to include uh, to diversity. Again, uh, as an 
editorial board member of several journals when I'm uh, handling papers in this field. That is one list that I often look at to ensure that there is some sort of uh, you know, a balance uh, at the gender level in terms of the reviewers. So I think this is absolutely uh, important and this should be integrated in, uh, at every level in best way that we can, uh, we can, we can do. And I think each one of us uh, have a responsibility to uh, do this uh, actively, consciously, so that you know, in future, this uh, can be. Uh, we, we don't have to discuss about this question; it's automatically yeah. there, so to say. I agreed. Agreed. I, yeah, I think everyone has. We all have this responsibility of making sure that the more diverse the the, the field is, and the more diverse the scientific community is. So that right. you know, different perspectives, different ideas come from different people from different backgrounds, and from, from different um, you know backgrounds, genders, and things like that. I think I, I put in the question, and and I thought to myself, it's I'm sad that I have to. We, we're talking about this because in my mind, as long as you have a hypothesis, a scientific hypothesis and you you do the best you can to try and answer that question it's right. it doesn't matter where you come from or what's your gender just just you know focus on the science do your best and and try to include as many collaborators as many people as possible because at the end of the day we're all working to understand a biology that is very complex and hopefully the goal is to improve human health Yes, you are absolutely right. There's no doubt about it. You're absolutely right. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Arun, for your time. Before we leave, sure. I wanted to ask you, uh, when you have uh, positions open in your team, where do you advertise them? Where can people find you? And before you answer the question, I wanted to let you know and let the audience also know that on Dr. GPCR, we do have a career page and we invite anyone and everyone to uh, advertise on it. Uh, just send us an email at hello at drgpcr.com and we'll be happy to advertise positions. And again, uh, the other side, flip side of the coin that we also offer a free membership so that people uh, who want to sign up, they can have a kind of a LinkedIn for GPCRs uh, on our website. And the hope is to connect uh, job seekers, students, um, people who want to work in industry, for example, uh, to, to potential uh, employers to uh, continue working on DPCRs. Right, so um, the positions that we have, we typically advertise it on our website. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are always looking for sort of motivated people who are interested in working on different aspects. So in the lab, we are doing uh, cell signaling, we are doing uh, hardcore structural biology, uh, synthetic biology, chemical uh, biology aspects. So we're always looking for people with uh, any interest or any expertise in these areas where they can utilize their expertise to address the questions in the field of GPCR biology. And at, at the same time, also learn new things which are going on in the lab. So it's always uh, uh, advertised on our website. Um, some of the other news forums or uh, sort of uh, community forums that we use something called uh, CCP4B bulletin board, which is a bulletin board for people uh, interested primarily in crystallography, but structural biology in general. So uh, postdoctoral positions, we advertise there as well. Oh, fantastic. Um, the transcript for this podcast, as well as the links to the uh, um, job boards and as well a link to, to, your, to your profile will be posted on the website and then people can reach out to you. But if you have Wonderful. any questions you'd like to advertise, just um, you know, reach out to us. We'll be happy to, to do so. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you so That's much. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure having you. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. I did. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was fun. A lot of fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hi, Arun. Welcome back. Thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. I wanted to reach back to you and talk to you a little bit more uh, about how you were doing with this pandemic that the entire world is, is going through. So how have uh, things changed and how are you? 
Well, it's uh, it's a difficult situation as uh, as we all know. Um, the labs were shut down for about uh, two months here in India um, at our institution. Um, the students and uh, the postdoctoral fellows they were asked to go back. Uh, now it has been uh, almost um, three months since the lockdown, and uh, postdoctoral fellows are back to the lab, still working with some restrictions. But the PhD students are still not allowed back in the lab um, for obvious reasons. And it has been, uh, as I said, more than three months, and which means that the productivity has taken a hit. Um, but obviously, safety first, and therefore, uh, in a way, we are glad that our students are at home, they are safe. And when the situation improves, we will uh, ask them to return back to the lab and start working. Um, here at IIT Kanpur, it's a fully residential campus, which means all the students, that is graduate students, undergraduate students, master students, they all live in the campus premises. We, the faculty members and the staff members of the institution, we also live in the same campus. Um, so things have been difficult, but our institution has tried their best to manage everything. And so far, uh, we have managed things well. Um, but we are really looking forward um, for the situation to improve so that our PhD students can come back to the lab and uh, continue their research. They are, of course, sitting at home. They are also very uh, frustrated because it's uh, delaying their progress, their projects, their research as well. But uh, fingers crossed for uh, things to improve soon. Let's see how it pans out. I hope so. I hope so. It's been difficult. A lot of people have been spending time at home and take, finally taking the time to write up all those papers and analyze the re remaining data. And although we've been hit with the pandemic, um, Last month in June, uh, I compiled, we compiled over 50 publications that were directly related to GPCR function or GPCR biology, which is great. Right. So in one month, over 50 publications, that means that everyone is spending some time at home to, right. uh, to write up whatever needed to, to be written up. Um, do you keep contact with your team? Uh, how has it been to switch from you know an in-person lab meeting to uh, to Zoom meetings or, you know, online meetings? Right. So, yes, we are doing uh, very frequent uh, sort of lab meetings or, you know, short group uh, discussions on different projects with different students. So we are continuously in touch. Um, of course, this is not a very easy transition because this was very sudden. Uh, we were not prepared for this. And our students in general, they are in different parts of India. And in some places, the internet connectivity sometimes is not optimal. So that also poses a, a challenge, but uh, we try to stay in touch very frequently uh, by, uh, by online platforms, also through emails and uh, you know, over the phone. We're trying our best to stay in touch and sort of uh, continue to do whatever we can uh, while staying at home. For the past uh, one and a half months, the lab is open, so the postdoctoral fellows who are working in the lab, they're back. So I'm, of course, coming to the lab, sitting in my office, and it's, I'm really uh, sort of very glad to see that some work is going on in the lab, uh, not at a full strength, but at least to see that the lab is open, there's some things which are moving, that, uh, that is great. But uh, hopefully the uh, students can come back soon and we can uh, pick up things in uh, full steam. Yeah, the routine has been, uh, everyone's routine has been disturbed, whether whether you're a three-year-old or you're, you're a postdoc, it's uh, it's difficult and it's, an, it's a new way of doing things and I'm sure that the students will be happy to get back to normal. Are there any specific um, new rules, new regulations around working in the lab that, you know, are, are in place to to limit any, any, uh, any propagation of the virus? Right, so we are uh, trying to follow uh, social distancing and uh, you know wearing masks. So our campus uh, has a very strict policy that if you're not wearing a mask, you're not allowed to enter in the residential area or in the academic area. So that is very strictly imposed. Uh, while working in the lab, 
uh, because the number of people are small at this point. So we are able to maintain social distancing. Uh, there are time restrictions when you can come to the lab, uh, by what time you can stay in the lab. So for example, if I don't leave my office in the next 30 minutes, the main gate, the doors will be closed. So I will not be able to go home. Um, so there are uh, sort of guidelines and restrictions uh, which are in place to, and we're trying our best to follow them to, you know, sort of uh, stay safe from the virus. You brought in uh, that the fact that the life has changed for everybody, starting from the young kids to uh, other people. Uh, I think, in a way, one thing that has been good during this time is my son, who just uh, going to be turning eight. He got a lot of uh, my attention and my time during the last three, four months. So we have played a lot of cricket together, uh, and other indoor and outdoor games together. So he has really been very happy. His school was also closed, so uh, he got to spend more time with me. Um, so that has been one sort of you know good thing, if you if you count that in. Oh, definitely, definitely. I have a five-year-old son, and we've. I, I'm, I'm happy to be able to to see him grow and, and develop every day and we get to spend way more time together than than before so that's definitely a, a positive in that right. I think one one message that that you know crosses my mind is yes it's difficult time it is a burden for a lot of people because a lot of people got sick a lot of people uh, unfortunately passed away and it's an economic burden at the same time but I think it forces us as humans, to reevaluate what's important, absolutely, and to better appreciate, uh, you know, the human contact, each other, and um, hopefully we'll come out stronger at at the other end of, of this pandemic. Absolutely, let's hope so. Thank you so much, Arun. My pleasure. It was a great pleasure catching up again. Sure, my pleasure. I'll let you go so that the gate doesn't <laughs> close. <Right. laughs> Otherwise, you're going to have to spend the night to, night at the office. Thank you so much. Great. Take care. Take All the care. best. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We really hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the podcast where you listen to podcasts to access all our episodes. If you'd like to sponsor us, please visit drgpcr.com slash sponsors. We truly appreciate your support, which allows us to bring you more podcast episodes, newsletters, and so much more. I'd like to thank Dr. Arun Shukla, Attila Forrest, Jin Chong, Shivani Sashdev. Music by Rosa Bershish. I'm your host, Dr. Yamina Bershish. Thank you for the privilege of your time, and until next time, stay safe.